get started. So welcome everybody to the Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center at Freedom Park. My name is Jessica. We are honored to have Captain Tom Struby here. Thank you all for joining us. We have pretty tight quarters because what a great turnout. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, before I forget, I want to say, where did Mary go? Um, everyone is invited to Mary's house, oh, Mary Pat's house, sakes. down on the river. Um, she can give you more details after the program if you would like to continue the discussion with Captain Tom after the program. So, yeah, Captain Tom is going to tell you all about his life as a riverboat captain. He grew up on the banks of the Mississippi here in Prescott, and he was the youngest captain ever to be licensed out of Chicago, Illinois. At that time. The youngest. Yep. Fantastic. At the age of 21. So what an immense amount of responsibility that he had. He's going to tell us all about it. He has a fantastic book that he has written all about towboats. So if you're interested, you can purchase books from Captain Tom after the program. And we also have copies here at the facility for later on if you want to come back for a second copy. I want to say thank you especially to Tom thank you. Uh, for being here, yep. his family and his friends for coming out to support him. Thank you to our sponsors. We have a lot of donors, members, supporters, volunteers who make these programs possible. Uh, Prescott Community Television for filming this program. You'll be able to watch it on Prescott Community Television and online after the program. They donated this fabulous television that we use for nearly every program. So huge thanks to them. Thank you to the Nelson Family Foundation, the Gertrude Sheely Charitable Trust, the Prescott Foundation, and again all of our members, our donors, our volunteers, our board of directors, all these people together make these programs possible and I'll do my best to be the finger that advances the slideshow. So thank you. <laughs> thank you Jessica and thank you all for coming. This is really a real unique pleasure. Um, for those of you that don't have a long history with Prescott, I grew up here. We played in this park. Jessica tells me it's the 70th anniversary of 90th, 90th anniversary of the tourist park this year. And we played here when there was nothing but a kind of a concrete gazebo and, and it was pretty Spartan. You still had the view of the river. But uh, another thing that we did continuously when we marched in the high school band, we stopped here on the way to the cemetery every year with Dave Zeron's band. So again, thank you, Jessica. When we went to write the book last year, um, the book was written and then suddenly I realized you can't use anybody else's pictures. So we said, okay, we have to get in the car. So we came over to Minnesota last year uh, for a three week trip and we took 7,000 pictures and most of them ended up in the, in the book. But that's how we got here. When we were here, I talked to Jessica. I said, write this book. What about, what, do, what would you think about having it available? Oh, absolutely. And can you come and do a talk? And I said, okay. <laughs> so that's how we ended up here today. So uh, again, I want to congratulate everybody who's involved in this beautiful facility, this beautiful center. Any of the, the uh, Prescott boosters past and present and acknowledge any of the board members who might here might be here, any of the special legacy donators who are here. What a beautiful facility and what a first class operation here. So um, I, I, the, uh, I'll start, I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, how the book came to be. We'll look at uh, what it's like to work on a river as a towboat captain and some of the details about actually steering a tow and a towboat from place to place. And then I'm going to do a little brief, just a quick brief biography for anybody who doesn't have a long Prescott history about myself. I was raised initially on a family farm located about five miles east of Prescott. Elizabeth Benson is here and she lived right across the street and you're Mrs. Anderson and she was my second grade Sunday school teacher. We walked from our house to the church, kicking a can both ways, and it's so neat to, to see you. There's there's so many memories that way. But I was raised there right next to St. John's Church on County QQ, and it's about a mile from Joe's Valley Bar and Grill, for those of you could that have that as a kind of a waypoint. We moved to town when I was seven or eight. We lived in some rental homes, and then my dad built our family home, which is now directly across from where the fire hall is located. And I spent every summer and fall day as a kid down by the riverfront. And I hung out at, yep. <laughs> oh, one more slide. Thanks you again to Jessica and every, one more please. Um, and another one. And another one. 
And there's Captain Dick's boat dock. I hung out there. I was the unofficial, another slide please, I was the unofficial dock boy at the Price Right Liquor Store. This is in 19, well I gotta think about it, 60, two I suppose or three and at that time Minnesota was closed to liquor on Sundays and Prescott did a land office business and the Price Right Liquor Store really did a land office business and they came by car and they came by boat and that's that's kind of a lot of what happened in terms of how I became really thoroughly in love with the river and then one more slide then I uh, somewhere along the way I moved up up the stream a little bit up to the to the uh, to the to the uh, steamboat Bach and dock boats there and spent every summer day there and it, it was just it was just a wonderful scenario I was one more please I was a proud graduate of Prescott High School and I can't say enough about these three people Dave Zaron took our little band that we had at that time and created uh, an energy and a uh, push or move towards expertise or towards really good stuff that we had never experienced before and he was just fabulous Richard Balliette when I were big pals he was the principal and Mr. Fogarty was the was the uh, annual advisor and I was the editor of the annual for a couple of years took a lot of pictures and the, my point of bringing that up is I hope that Prescott High School is the same today as it was then because there is there was no way that you could substitute the, what what all of us got from that, we, I think I graduated with 68 kids. Um, so it was a small town sort of scenario, but we, boy did we have a wonderful school opportunity there. And I hope it's the same way today. I can't say enough good about that. So um, then we go on. <clears throat> so I spent 20 years as an active pilot and captain. This particular boat uh, is was called the WS Ray, and it was a Valley Line big, at that time it was a big Valley Line boat. And the first time I went by here as a deckhand on that boat, I was really proud. That was, that was probably a year into, into the work that I was doing. Um, chapter one goes into a lot of detail about the first 20 years that I spent as an active pilot. My kids came along during that second decade, and so I migrated towards heavy marine construction. One more slide there. Well, and one of my favorite, favorite, favorite boats is, was the Sioux. I got an opportunity. I was relief captain with Denny Shuckling at that time. He 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 drove it most of the summer, but occasionally I got to run it. And it was it was such a neat opportunity. If you just flip this picture, um, one morning as I came through, my dad was standing right there on this side taking a picture of me. I didn't know he was there. I just walked out on the flying bridge and there he was and I was really proud. That was a, that was a kind of a proud moment. He was a, he was a, he worked on the river at one point and he ended up, uh, he was very proud of me. That's another boat that was one of my absolute favorites. <clears throat> I worked for Twin City Barge in the Minneapolis St. Paul Harbor and that was a, that was a fun boat. Okay, Jessica. Couple pictures of other boats that I piloted and I was captain on and then we go to, and then after, in the, about kind of the back end of that second decade, I moved a lot towards marine, heavy marine construction. I don't know, Bob Paulson here? Hi, Jerry. <laughs> I thought maybe Bob Paulson might be here. He was the construction superintendent for Twin City Shipyard at that time, and I was one of the captains that floated the old railroad bridge out of there and floated the new one in. It was quite a quite an event at the time. And another slide, Jessica. I also was the last towboat captain underneath the old high bridge in St. Paul. I don't know if, if any of you remember when they exploded that. The Loazzo brothers were the, um, the dynamite demolition experts and they're world famous. And if you go to YouTube today and just Google YouTube and the St. Paul High Bridge, you'll see four or five principal news, like Channel 11, Channel 5 news reports. And the highlight of the news report <laughs> is how the thing was supposed to go at noon and it ended up to be about 4.30 or 5 o'clock before we finally dropped it in the river. <laughs> and I, I will never forget that. It, there was 50, 60, 80,000 people lining the bank. And about two o'clock we went down, just the, the owner of the construction company that was the manager of this operation said, you know, we got to go talk to these people. And so I was on the loudspeaker, sorry, we're having a little delay, the circuits didn't test, and the people were just booing, and I thought they were going to throw it. <laughs> and I thought, well, what did you pay to see this? You know, it's not like we... Anyway, that's kind of a cute story about that. Uh, another one, Jessica. And so in... 
in, in 2012, I retired. I, I worked for the city of Egan for 21 years, and then I worked for the city of Minnetonka for three years after that. And then in 2012, I retired from uh, Minnesota Public Service, and we moved to Goodyear, Arizona. Goodyear is a western suburb of Phoenix, and I work now for the city of Avondale there. I'm the payment management coordinator. I ended up with a kind of a strong background and expertise in telling people what to do to fix roads. <laughs> and that's, that's what I do now. And this is our front deck. In Arizona, everybody has outdoor spaces that they live in. And this is our front deck at our house in Arizona. And so we really enjoy it there. We're just having a wonderful time there. Um, I continued, even when I was doing the... Um, the heavy marine construction and then even when I got to work, I went to work for Egan. I continued to do trip pilot work on weekends for a, for a long time. So um, so then I guess why the book? How'd the book come about? Um, every single time in all the years that I've um, told people, well, you know, at one point in my life I was a towboat captain. They would go, really? That's amazing. What was that like? How did it work? How did you steer? They seem like they're really big and, and oh my goodness, goodness, how do the people live on them? And I, so I thought, well, there's a book there that <laughs> clearly people have. And, and it, if you think about it logically, there's only a handful relative to the total population. There's only a handful of people that work in that profession, especially in the pilot house in that profession. So I thought there's an opportunity to do that. Set out to, to put it together. Um, I never stopped loving the river and what it meant to me and everything anytime I'm around any kind of water it, it, uh, I can't get anything I can't get enough of it so my entrepreneurial side kind of recognized that this might be a, a good opportunity you know to, to write the book Shannon my bride who's out here always said well you should write the stories because all of us towboaters there's a handful in the room here people that work on the river we have a lot of stories and we don't hesitate to tell them to one another and every time they get told and retold and retold they get embellished just a little bit more <laughs> and it might not be a hundred percent true, but there, um, the stories are coming, and I'm about eighty percent done with the second book. There'll be probably a third, and then if everything goes right, I'd like to write a fourth book. I'm kind of soliciting towboat cook recipes. Problem is, there isn't a towboat cook that's ever been that has a recipe in writing. It's all in their head. So I don't know how that's. It seems like that would be a good idea, but I don't know if it's plausible. But. Um, one more slider, just good. So on to the how about life on board a towboat. So I'm just going to do a kind of a brief run through of a few things that way. So there's two towboat scenarios fundamentally. There's live aboard boats and there's lunch bucket boats. Typically the boat, there was just a tow that went by here as we came into town about 12, uh, 1230. Uh, 12 loads southbound, and that's a liveaboard live aboard boat. So they have a captain, a pilot, a big boat like that, probably 5,000 horsepower. They have a chief engineer, and most likely an assistant engineer, and maybe even an oiler. And that oiler would be the person that would be responsible to kind of keep the engine. If you go into an engine room of a big towboat, it's spotless. They're almost all just squeaky clean. Stainless steel and it, horrible noise and horrible heat, but it's they're just really a, an amazing thing. Um, then you'd have a cook in the galley typically, and you'll have either a first or a first and second mate, or and then probably like two deckhands on each watch. And then there's a forward watch and a back watch on a liveaboard boat. So six in the morning, till noon and then six in the evening till midnight is the front watch and vice versa is the after watch. The captain and the pilot do exactly the same thing. They both drive the boat, but the pilot does nothing but drive the boat and the captain is essentially the CEO. He does, he's, a, he's responsible for all the overarching decisions administratively, personnel, makes any decision about anything that needs to be decided and the pilot just drives. He doesn't really, I mean, he's responsible. He tells his deck crew what to do when they're going through a lock or something like that, but that's all the pilot does. He's not responsible for any major decisions that way. Lunch bucket boats, you'll see around the harbor, they're typically smaller. That picture of that Itasca was, that was a liveaboard boat, but I think now it's a lunch bucket boat. And typically a lunch bucket boat, the crew works a 12 hour shift. So it'll be six in the morning till six at night. And then there's a night shift from six at night till six in the morning. And the reason that 
typically is 12 hours is because they do a what they call a crew change and those people mostly live well they all if it's a lunch bucket job they live at home somewhere they drive to a location that everybody agrees on they get in a company car and they go to where the boat is they shift to other crew leaves they go home and it goes they just go to reverse like that all the time so that's kind of the two different types of of uh, tow boat scenarios the live aboard boats most commonly are 30 day hitches and when I did it, it was almost always 30 days on and 30 days off. Or you got, you got a 30 day paid time off, you could work for somebody else in that interim, but that's kind of how they do that. And I think it's still pretty common. There's material service in Chicago was a company that I worked for. There was a guy in town here named Bob Lubick that worked for them and they were three weeks on and three weeks off. So sometimes it's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, the accommodations, food, exercise, I think as we've all moved in the direction of uh, being more fit, I think there's probably uh, a sort of a fitness scenario on tow boats today that wasn't available when I was doing it. You just walked on the tow whenever you could or got off on the lock wall and went for a walk or did whatever you could, but it wasn't very, wasn't very fitness friendly in those years. But when you see the large boats go by, those boats have pretty nice generous accommodations especially for the officers for the chief engineer and assistant engineer the cook probably has a good set of quarters but captain and pilot really have nice digs and the pilot house is nice when you the smaller you see the boat the more compact everything gets and to the point that some can be really really spartan and, and kind of cramped but it's just the way it's just the nature of the thing you'll see typically these bigger boats with a bigger tow a standard Jumbo tow, uh, uh, the most economical tow scenario for a line haul boat that they call these Liverpool boats that you'll see go by here. Almost, well, without exception, you'll see 15 barges, sometimes 12. This depends, they may, like if they leave St. Paul with 12, someplace right down here, they're gonna pick up three more, because 15 is the optimum. They stick the first nine in the lock, and then they bring the second set, which is six in the boat, and that's a double locking. A tow is 1,200 feet long if it's 15 barges. That's five barge lengths, each 200 feet, and 105 feet wide. So that's, think of looking down, if you had four football fields stacked end to end, another one and another one, that's, that's what the pilot sees when he looks out of the pilot house. And it's about 40 feet shy of being the same width as a football field is wide. So it's kind of a big, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a big operation, and again, um, if it's a smaller boat, 2,000 horsepower boat, maybe you'll have six, eight, ten barges, but a, a larger boat, you know, have, have more equipment that way. Um, I, there's a lot to talk about about steering a tow boat, and we'll get into a little bit of that. In page 72 in the book, let me make a little pitch for that, I talk about a crash plan. And that may sound funny, but it it's an actual fact. There is not a time when you're navigating upstream or down that you're not responsible to think about what the next opportunity, what, if you're gonna pass somebody, you're gonna make a bridge, if you've got a corner coming up, and there's an opportunity for something to go wrong, you have to primarily, most of the time you're thinking about your crash plan. Where can I land? Where can the boat, where can the tow settle into the bank? Or if I, if I miss the turn, I have to stop. How am I gonna stop without doing any damage to anything on shore? or to the tow or to the tow boats. That's, that really is very, very true. You have a crash plan all the time. People think about that. Um, the steering just up and down the river is mostly mundane. It's, it's not really rocket science of any, of any sort. But anytime you pass another tow boat, anytime you go through a bridge, anytime you make a lock, some of the short, tight places, it, it, it's, uh, it can be real challenging. Um, wind and weather make a big difference if you have um, you'll very, very seldom see 15 empties, but if you have five lengths, 20 feet high, 1,200 feet long, and, and you get in a downburst wind, it's, you, the tow just goes. You just keep the boat in the channel, and you don't really have a lot. <laughs> when that hits and when it comes, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a deal. And then night versus day. Everything, I think there's a slide that shows the pilot at night, Jessica. There's a deck crew, and the next one, I think, is nighttime. Anything, everything at night becomes six times harder, six times more difficult. Towboats have immensely powerful searchlights. You'll see them, I'm sure you've seen them when you come back and forth. One of the things I'll ask you to notice if you're looking at two towboats approaching one another in the dark, 
is you'll see sometimes the searchlight will go way up in the air and they'll go over here and then they'll go down and they'll they'll look at something over here. Then they'll bring that light back up and over here. And the reason is they go we go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that I don't shine that light in that other pilot's eyes. And they'll do the same for us. So you those lights, if if your eyes are adjusted to the dark and you get one of those in the you're you're talking a, a seven aspirin headache <laughs> for, at the very least, and it screws up your night vision completely. So it it's kind of a deal. But anyway, so there you know the boats have lots of lights for working around fleets and stuff like that. But it, it just everything is a little bit harder at night. So I, I thought when I was putting the talk together, what can I talk about specifically that might be really interesting? I came up with a couple of things. So navigating a tow requires steering from behind. And that, if we could, if we could cue up that video. So yeah, see if it's there. It might have gone away. When I, when you came in, you were, you might have been watching a YouTube video. There is, uh, I passed around cards. Did everybody get a card? Business card. Okay. On the card, there's emails for Shannon and I, and there's a, a link to it there. Our, our, our website is called bookworks.com with a Q. And if you go to bookworks.com, there's actually a whole bunch of YouTube videos that I put, put aside just for this talk. The, the, the one thing I want to talk about right now is about how if you steer your car, your automobile, if you turn the steering wheel, the front of your car turns. Okay? A towboat is completely opposite. When you steer, it all happens on the back. It steers completely from behind. So what you'll notice, this is the Hastings Bridge, and any of you, if you're, ever, if you're over that way and you see a towboat, go down on the river there and watch them do this, because it's just fascinating. But in a minute here, okay, now watch, that's called a jack staff, and watch how, see how the tow is dropping down into the bend, and the jack staff is not moving. It's, it's just almost stable and the tow continues to follow and go all the way down into the bend there. And I just thought this was a really good way to demonstrate. So that's the captain or the pilot's job is to evaluate and anticipate and steer ahead of the game so that you always provide that space for the back of the tow going through a turn or anything that's like that. Another thing that they will do in in Hastings, especially if the water's up a little bit, they'll back up and flank it. And this guy's got 12 loads and he's steering that. And that's, that's a, he's got some grass ones. That's a, I don't know if I would. This is, but again, notice that this hasn't moved a bit. See how the toe is still set. And this is that slide that occurs. So you're always evaluating and thinking about that when you're, when you're operating a towboat. You have to have that space to, to do that. There's. A bunch of other videos. Now he's, you know, the, the whoever took the video did a kind of a time lapse, and now he's just going to go down through the railroad bridge. And it's pretty straightforward at this point. He's just going, Jessica, can you advance it to about there? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, right about there. Now I'll just continue to talk. But now you're going to see, <laughs> now he's past the railroad bridge, and in a little bit the ch picture changes, and you'll see again the butt and the whole toe drops way down deep into this bend. And it'll kind of explain how that works a little bit better for you. <clears throat> um, as I said, one other thing, if you if you're if you're re if you're really interested in this, anytime you see a towboat in Hastings, look and see what they do. Go down there by the river and watch them. Because another thing that they'll do, so think about where the lock is, and a tow. If there's any kind of current at all, because that's really a sharp bend, right on top of those two bridges. So what they'll do is they'll drop the tow right down into, just come down floating, drop the tow down underneath the highway bridge, and then just back up and stop. And then the current always runs in the bends. There's hardly any current in the point, but the current always runs down around the bend. So the current will get on the side of that tow, and if you just watch him, pretty soon the tow will kind of float forward, and he hasn't steered at all. The boat's just stare, just stuck in there. And as it comes around, you get all that weight moving, then you just, when he gets around and it, it looks kind of good, then you'll see him, the smoke will come out and away they go, and they'll punch it and drive down through there. So. Um, so that's, it's kind of a fun, that's called flanking. And you do that same thing, um, we're gonna, when we, after we finish watching this, um, there's a couple of slides and I'll show you where they, lock number three, right down here in Red Wing, is a miserable lock to get into when the water's <laughs> I mean, it, it used to be, 
in the back in my day, most of us got in there without a help, the help of a tug. Now there's a tug that sits there all the time. And it just became such an issue with crashes that I think the, you know, the fact of the matter is, and it takes a long time. <clears throat> um, I want to explain this. If what you get near a lock, if there's any kind of r water running, you'll see the lock and then you'll see the dam over here. The water comes down and it's just going along, but then right away at the lock wall, it goes right over towards the dam. That's called an outdraft. And it's a terrifically challenging thing. And what you can't do, because you steer from the back, so let's say you're coming along there and you're starting to experience that outdraft, you can't steer to counter it, to keep your toe over here by the lock, because otherwise you're going you're to go over the dam, right? <laughs> so, and that, that's what you don't want to do. So they do what's called flanking and the, the toe will drop down real tight to the bank. They throw a giant monkey, a long, narrow monkey line out. They grab this long lock line, they fasten it to the barge in the toe, and then they check the toe into the lock wall. And it's a, it takes a long time, and I think really the risk involved and the time it takes, if they have to pay a tug five, six hundred bucks to put them on the wall and they're through, that's probably what, you know, that's probably how that goes. Um, and you can go ahead, Jessica, please, or go back to the PowerPoint. You're doing a really good job for a, for a non-native technician here. And go all the way to, keep going, keep going, some more, some more, some more, some more. No, one more. Okay, another place that you might really have fun watching towboats is downtown Red Wing. That's the curve. It's almost a horseshoe. When you're sitting down here at the Red Wing, you know, the Red Wing in there, you don't recognize that, but these guys come all the way down here. So that tow is, if he's gonna steer that, he's got, his butt is right down here at the elevator and he'd be going, and then it gets down here, you got these marinas here, so you really have to be ultra careful. So if there's, that's another case, if you have any kind of high water, you'll watch them and they'll back, back up and flank that. They'll just bring it around and they'll kind of float around and float, and one more please, Jessica. And that's the Hastings Bridge. Again, you can see how sharp that steer is. And the bridge pier, or the highway bridge, is only here. So they only have, there is a, did any of you, some of you have gray hair like me here. <laughs> did, have any of you seen a tow actually hit that concrete abutment that was there in Hastings? They used to, there used to be a construction crew that worked on that pier. And the moment that they left, another tow would come and hit it. It was nonstop for years. It really was. And back in, really, really back in the day, um, when the old Hastings Railroad Bridge was in there, um, that, that, that was the, probably the worst bridge for a towboat captain downstream on the planet at that time. It was extremely narrow. The inside, if you had two channels, you would have talked to the inside. But the inside span had been repaired so many times that the shear fence kept kind of migrating towards the river to the point where it wasn't wide enough to get 105 feet of barges through there, loaded barges. And it was just a crash looking for a place to happen all the time. It was always under repair. It was really a booger. And one of the things that's what's worth mentioning because it's sort of a regional in point of interest here is when you Think of the river, say for instance, when it floods out here, say you get 20 feet of extra water out here. You have water from here to the Minnesota shore. I mean, way all those islands are submerged and there's, there's an expanse of water. All the river goes right through this hole. There is no, there's a little bit of a backwater right here, but it's, there's 53 feet of water there, I know, because we took the old bridge pier out and we, well, we did all kinds of things, that was a, but there, but that, there, now think about putting your finger on a hose, it's the same thing, it's you put all that water in that hole and you got, you got speed, you got current, you got lots of pressure, and so anyway, yes, Jessica, <clears throat> there's a, a toe of 15 empties, one more, this is actually the American Beauty, and you may or may not be able to see this, but there's the mate on the head, and that is a lock line that's run up to the bank. I watched him do this, and I was just nervous for him because that boat shouldn't be out that far. Because you can get, you get so if if you really have enough outdraft, and let's say that the deck people weren't very sharp, and they 
they snag that line so that they, because they'll check it. They'll let some line out. And they're supposed to be able to continuously do that. But sometimes something happens and the line is stuck. And then suddenly the boat is going out over the dam. And they're then getting it back. You can, they actually keep an ax on the head deck in case that happens so that they can chop that line in case that's the, what they have to resort to. Because you can't let that boat get over here. It's going over the dam if it gets that far. One more. And this is, I think you can see there's, there's the red sign. If you're ever, there's a handful of locks where you can approach it and that's called an outdraft board. So if you're on the shore and you're kind of watching this happen or if you come in your own, in your own boat. So that, mean, that when, there's, when there's high water conditions, the minute there's an outdraft, so that water wants, it goes right, right down here and then it goes that way, it wants to go to the dam. That board sign comes up and then the captain or pilot knows that that's, we've got to deal with that. Okay, Jessica. And this is lock three, just an aerial picture. But when they come down to lock three and they flank in there, the boat is right up here. In fact, they actually, the Corps actually built a pier so that they can, if you, if you do it right, you can land your, turn your toe right against that pier and then kind of help it, you know, get a line there and flank it over to the rest of the thing. Then another little issue that, that I think is fascinating is depth of water. Now, I just said that the water underneath the Hastings Bridge is 53 feet. But the water right out here might be 16 feet deep. The most average river channel depth is 12 to 18, 19 feet, something like that. I don't know how many of you observe towboats, but you'll see on every tow, empty or loaded, you'll see these transducers. They're called transducers. It's, it's a shaft at the bottom of it. There's a very sophisticated depth finder. So in the pilot house, there's two like depth finder gauge deals, and they each have an alarm. And so you might think, well, if the pilot goes, gets off course, that those are designed to tell him he's off course. So if, so if you're, if you're, if 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 the pilot's going along and 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 he, you know, he's off course, he's going to hit a wing dam, and suddenly the water goes to three feet. Well, that's way too late for that. What these are for is to let the captain or pilot know if he's going along and suddenly there's a shoal or a, or a shallow spot and the depth goes to say nine or 10 feet, then they have to pull the throttles back right away. Because if they keep going along, they'll actually take all the water, you can suck all the water from out from underneath the tow, the tow will hit bottom, the boat will hit bottom. It's literally that. And if, if you get in a shallow spot, so that's what those are for. They're not there to tell the guy he's gonna run over a wing down. That, that, isn't, that isn't how that's done. So. Um, I think that that's kind of one of the most fascinating, or another one of the most fascinating things uh, that's, that's about there. So I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. Um, one more, Jessica. Uh, there's, there's the view from the pilot house. And I, um, if you look out and you think about what it must be like to, to kind of visualize that distance and what's going on out there from where you are, I mean, it's, it's pretty important. Um, in the last chapter of the book here, I'm going to read it to you. It's called Watch the Bump. And, and one of the things, the, the story came from an experience that I had, and it's kind of humorous. But one of the things, I was uh, blessed to be a, a person who trained a lot of the cub pilots when I worked for Twin City Barge. One of the things I kept, I drilled into pilots over and over and over, because they would be doing this, and they would stare out there, and you have to watch your headway all the time. You just, you just absolutely have to because there's somebody in the head that might be giving you signals, they might be talking to you, but you ultimately are responsible because you know how much water you have, you know how much power you have, you know how the boat handles when you back. You wanna make sure that you're going slow enough that you don't crash, so you always, always, always watch your headway. <clears throat> well, that's something I drilled into cub pilots and nobody, you're, you're just, you're looking out there because it's, man, I, and, and you're really, you don't really naturally just look sideways. So that's, that's, that's something that, that happened that way. Just, I think, okay. I'm gonna read you this last chapter with, with your permission. I hope that's all right. It's, it's really kind of comical. And it actually happened just the way that, I've, that I'm explaining here. So starts out, watch the bump. I yelled into the intercom of the pilot house council. From the galley, the response was garbled, but it let me know that they'd heard me. It was a common safety practice while navigating the towboat to try to contact folks in the galley if there might be enough of a jolt to be concerned about. 
It was about 5.20 a.m. in the morning aboard the towboat Windy City. I was piloting light boat, navigating without barges. That's, that's what they call light boat. We were moving really fast in deep water about a mile from shore out on the Lake Michigan. Um, we were approaching more barges behind the big lake water, big lake breakwater. We had orders to pick up one of them and take it with us as part of our tow on the downbound leg of our journey. I had the pilot house, front pilot house window open, even though it was early in December, and I was hoping that the brisk pre-dawn lake air would keep me alert. Early mornings, right, after, right before the sun peeked over the horizon, were always a struggle for me after a long night of peering into the darkness while navigating. I said to the deckhand sitting beside me on the couch, I hadn't been watching my headway carefully enough. Over and over, I had instructed the trainee towboat pilots entrusted to me about this very same journeyman error. Always watch your headway. Look out to your side, observe how fast you're moving forward. I said over and over. See those trees on the shore? Keep turning your head and pay attention to how fast you're going. You must be acutely aware of your forward momentum all the time. I should have been especially aware, far out on the water, where I just couldn't look sideways at the shore to judge my forward speed. The loaded barges immediately in front of us, in front of the boat, were coming up too fast. I had been running almost full ahead, and I brought the power controls called ship-ups back to neutral. On a, on a towboat, how many have been on a towboat in the pilot house? If you bring them back to neutral, they almost all go pshh. That there's a, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely noise. But in this case, in this case, I did that. Um, the power controllers on the Windy City were pneumatic, and the sharp exhaust of the air punctuated the otherwise silent pilot house. On some towboats, you could actually move these levers from all the way forward, all the way back, and to go into full reverse without pausing. Not on the Windy City. <laughs> she had a peculiar characteristic that if you didn't pause long enough, the control would not actuate, and then you'd have to go through the same process all over again to go back to neutral. Knowing I was in trouble, I waited for the longest microsecond of my life, and I shipped both controls full to stern. The port engine of the 1400 horsepower twin screw towboat reversed. The starboard engine did not. After shouting into the intercom to warn the galley, I made sure to adjust the backing rudder so that at least we would hit the barge dead flush, dead square. Much less damage occurs if you take a heavy jolt over the entire headlog, the front surface of the towboat, as opposed to hitting just a corner. In the last second before we crashed, the five foot diameter propeller connected to the port engine did a fantastic job in that deep water. Most of our headway was gone, and it was unlikely that any severe damage to either the towboat or the barge would occur. But bump, we did. <laughs> very firmly and nice and flat, even across the bobs, ordering most of the energy, enough to move a few things forward on the galley table <laughs> into the laps of the folks seated there, <laughs> including a full container of orange juice into the captain's lap. <laughs> Did I mention the crankiest, not a morning person, towboat captain you ever met? Oh, and maybe I should mention our serious lack of admiration for each other. Maybe it was karma. <laughs> our fabulous cook, Tom Cullen, loved to present everything on the table in mammoth proportions. And those being served at the galley counter in the Windy City faced the stern of the towboat. So that morning, directly astern from and in the forward path of Captain Grumpy on the galley counter was a filled to the brim, two gallon pitcher of fresh orange juice. Well, not a serious enough bump to cause any damage to the boat or any of the occupants. The jolt moved that tall, top-heavy orange juice container rapidly forward towards the bow of the boat, immediately and right square into the lap of Captain Grumpy. <laughs> I heard shouting and laughing down on the head deck of the boat as the on-duty deck crew placed the face wires on the barge we were picking up. I leaned out of the pilot house window to investigate. Two of the off-duty deck crew had witnessed the horrible orange juice incident and were jumping up and down and catching their, between catching their breath from laughing and they shouted up at me, it's been fun working with you, Struwy. <laughs> you are so in trouble. <laughs> Once they settled down, they told me in detail what had happened. I began to strategize how I would handle the massive butt chewing I was about to get. Towboats navigating the upper reaches of the Illinois River in and around Chicago use telescopic pilot houses that lower as they pass under the many low clearance bridges. 
The Windy City has a telescopic pilot house. The pilot house, when elevated, is perched on top of a tie, tall hydraulic cylinder. And out each side door of the pilot house, port and starboard, there was a landing that was connected to a set of rolling steps that kind of went up and down as the pilot house went up and down. Um, about 15 minutes after the bump incident, Captain Super Grumpy <laughs> came huffing up the starboard set of stairs, freshly showered and sporting a new change of clothes. He was screaming profanities of a caliber that I hadn't heard before. <laughs> As he was halfway up the starboard stair, I exited out the port pilot house door and did the same thing in reverse, seeking refuge below. I still think today about an incident that could have had such dire results and how it ended favorably for everybody except somebody who needed a daily excuse just to be ornerier. <laughs> Karma for sure. So that's it. I, I want to, again, thank Jessica and thank all of you for coming. This is such a pleasure. And I'd like to spend some time with questions. If anybody has any questions, I'll try to repeat them and explain anything that, that, that uh, you might. I, there's so many of you here that I just, I just want to hug. God, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of you in a long time. So questions. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I've been on the river now 47 years, still working on it. Well, you're one of the top five. Greg, I didn't even recognize you. My son, Greg Struby, is named after him. How are you, sir? Good. Yeah, is it Shannon? Yes. Oh, well, yep. this story, I kind of watched the bump. I think one of the funniest things that ever happened to me, we were on the Itasca, Twin City Fleet Building Co. And you had an eye for the ladies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. He had his binoculars out. And this very good looking woman was riding in a boat and she couldn't have been more than 20 feet, but Tom needed his binoculars. As he takes them out, a gust of wind closed the pilot house door and drove those binoculars so far into his eyes. <laughs> Only time I've ever seen him mad. He was the most calm, collected pilot I've ever worked with. Boy, was he mad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't funny, he said. No. <laughs> Greg was one of the most remarkable. You saw that picture on the slide set of the, the two men pulling the ratchet. The work that the deck crews do when they build a tow, the big tow that you see go by, there's 60 sets of rigging, a ratchet strap and a chain strap and a, and a wire most of the time on that, on that tow. That takes, a good crew takes, takes six, seven, eight, nine hours to build a 15 barge tow to do all the rigging. Greg worked on a boat and that's all they did, 12 hours a day for day after day after day. You guys were in the most exquisite physical condition and Greg had the, they, they were. <laughs> Greg had the most marvelous attitude. He was one mood all the time. Never ever ever saw him wound up or upset. Hard work, nice, he paced himself, smart worker at that time. You know, you went on to be a, a robust professional in a lot of other ways as it relates to the river industry. And he's a big advocate of the river. There's, there's, there's so many, you could, you could write six books. There's, there's, but, but I remember those days and I was never more respectful of a deckhand that worked for me than I was for you. You were just, you were just absolutely marvelous. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever work with John Prine? John? Prine, he was out of Illinois. Prine. I... He, a, he wound up, he was a musician, but he worked on the boat. Oh, I don't, I don't. Hartford. John Hartford, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think I did. No, I don't. No, no. Other questions? Easier going up river or down river? Always, almost always easier going upriver. You, you have the same spatial um, planning needs, but on a much, much slower pace. And you actually, um, when you're doing your maneuvering, you actually have to kind of watch for the current on the side of the toe. So you, you want to, whereas coming downstream, it's all about sliding all over. It's all about steering down into, but going up, you really don't, you don't really end up with that. You just want to, you don't want to get up too close to the points and various things, but yeah, much, 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 much easier going upstream. Yep. Yes, Tom. Are you at liberty to say who Mr. Captain Grumpy was? <laughs> it was, uh, 
Junior Jogerst, if I remember. He, Tom worked on, Tom Filkins is here, he worked on towboats, and, and a lot of us remember some of these. There's, I, you know what, I'm struggling with the second book in the stories. Um, one of my favorite authors who wrote a book about writing books said, she has a quote, and she says, if people are worried about what they did or said to you, they should have been kinder. <laughs> <laughs> And at the same time, though, I'm, I'm really going to be sensitive to the idea that, that if there's something unfavorable to say about somebody, I'm not going to use their real name. It, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but on, the other, on the other hand, I'd certainly um, name names for people that I knew and loved. Yes. Can I tell a very short story? Yes. Okay. First year on the tow boats, we're at Twin City Bars, and I, I pulled my uh, deckhand hat out of there. There you go. But it was, I think, Saturday afternoon, and, and we got all the work done, so we're all up at the work bars, and we're going to town at bars, break some. Tom's on that task, got last boat in, and he can't get in because the head of the boat is just a little bit wider than the back of the boat. And he can't get in, everybody's laughing, and the older captain, see that uh, young hot chef pilot, you know, how he's going to pull this one off, you know, because he come out of the Savage River, Minnesota River, high water, and split the beam with the smoke stack, and it was about two inches clear, and he was, well, too aggressive for the older pilot. So he goes out there, light boat, flanks around, spins around, didn't even counter steer the back, and backs it right in there with the bonnet, each at each side, and all these old captains look at that, that hot shot kid. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you, Tom. That's a nice compliment. Could you say, tell us, like, uh, a barge that we saw today, where do you think they're going? The, the question was, could you tell us the barge that came down here today, where do you think they're going? That's a, that's a, um, um, I was looking at the tow, and they had some coal. And what, somebody asked me uh, recently when I was talking about this, what the barges, what the tows carry. What you see going by here predominantly is salt, loads of salt northbound, almost all year long, and then grains, soybeans, corn, and wheat southbound, typically. It's changed a little bit because of the ethanol thing. A lot of the corn stays here that used to go down to the Gulf. Um, but there's, there's uh, the bulk, the biggest bulk numbers, and if you, there's a link at that website that I provided on our website that has a great deal of statistics that shows exactly the diff different commodities that go different areas around. But coal is a big, a lot of power, coal fired power plants right on the water because they need water for cooling and they deliver coal. Um, regionally, like Illinois coal is real high sulfur. So, so a, a coal plant that uses Montana coal that's not high sulfur might want to mix some of that high sulfur you know because it can push the limits it's cheaper and so on and so on and that comes right to them on the water so you'll see coal going by um scrap iron occasionally a barge load of scrap iron because we have the two refineries in town and correct me greg if i'm wrong about this but coke when when they refine crude oil one of the last products out the out the back end of it is called coke and it's like really fine um black like cold, dusty sort of particles, and it's super, super, super hot. So it's a very desirable fuel for, for I don't know what exactly they, they use it for. But, yeah. Okay. And you see some of that going by, but, but the most thing, I, um, we had a barge load of paneling back in the 70s that went into Chicago. They actually deliver a barge load of pure salt goes right on the barge, right into your bag, like table salt, up into Morton Salt in downtown Chicago, right north of the loop every day. You see sugar coming in barges. Um, somebody else asked me, they said, so then how do, they, how do they clean the barge out? So they'll take maybe whatever device they use to remove the bulk commodity, and they'll get it down to where there's not really too much. They might stick a bobcat in there, and they'll pop it in and grab it with a crane. And then people actually go in there with shovels. And, and brooms and sweep it out and then they hit it with a fire hose and it's just a big rusty metal container and at, at the end of the day yeah yep mm -hmm. Bob would you rather drive a barge that's full or empty um, the question was would I rather pilot a, a tow that was full barges or empty barges and full barges are um, a combination would be the best scenario mm -hmm. um, full, a whole tow of empty barges is really fun 
because it, every all the sliding and steering you do is extraordinarily exaggerated. So you just you get to really kind of test your skill. But at the same time, if you have some wind or something, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a bad deal. Typically, a towboat company, if you if they have a need to move a bunch of empties, they'll throw one or two loads in there, and that load is like a that keeps you from being impacted so dramatically from the wind. Um, loaded tows are, you just go slower and you're more careful. It's a lot, lot, lot heavier. 25,000 tons for a 15 barge loaded tow and a, and a boat. So, and it, it I, either way, I either one, they're both, um, they're, they're, it's, it, it's really fun to do. I really genuinely miss it. I, it's been a long time, many years. Um, I still have my license and it's still, renewed every five years, but it's not renewed in a way that I could use it. I would have to, since I was an active captain, they put in place a number of um, regulations that, are, that require a lot of radar and technical equipment um, training, and I don't have that. So I could, if I really wanted to, I could probably go back and do that. But honest truth is my eyesight at night probably wouldn't allow me to do it anymore. You really have to, it's a, it's a young person's game. You really, at nighttime, you gotta be able to see, and if and I don't even want to drive at night, so it's just you know it, it just is really a big deal. Yes. Is Red Wing really the sharpest turn on the Mississippi? No, no, it's not the sharpest turn on the Mississippi. But the good question is Red Wing really the sharpest turn on the Mississippi? It's one of the sharpest turns anywhere near here. But if you look at a map of the lower Mississippi, it's one horseshoe curve after another horseshoe curve after another horseshoe curve. There's, there's sharp turns lots of places. But that, that really is, if you, another thing that's kind of fun to do, well, two things. My wife and I have, um, well, we have an airplane app on our phones and our iPads, and we have a towboat app. There's an app that you can get where you can see every ship in the world, cruise ships, towboats, whatever it is. So if you're interested in doing this, you're going on a trip on the Great River Road and you want to see where the next towboat is so you can see where it's going to be in the lock, you can download that app to your phone or your iPad and you can get that. Um, uh, it's called Find Ships. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and at any point you can you can use Google Earth to look at the river and look at towboats. I do that all the time. It's pretty fun. You can see the different toes that they have and we are going tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday down the river to stop at boutiques and museums and various places to sell a book and I'm really looking forward to that. We've we've been enjoying that. We just uh, just a uh, month in April we we bought a camper in Columbus, Ohio, well, Lancaster, Ohio, because it was $5,000 cheaper than we can buy it in Arizona. So we drove over and we started at St. Charles, Missouri, and we sold the book all the way up the Illinois River, and went and grabbed the camper, and then we sold the book all the way down the Ohio River. We stopped at, <laughs> at Cincinnati and, and uh, um, um, Paducah, Kentucky, and Louisville, Kentucky, and so we've been having a lot of fun with it. It's, it's been a fun deal. Yes? Have you ever been to New Orleans? Yes. Yes. Down there. Oh, I love the city. It's one of my favorite places to visit as a tourist. Um, it's a busy, busy, busy harbor. Boy, it's just boat, 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 boat. They, they actually have traffic control there too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a. I didn't pilot there. Um, we took a construction boat down there and dropped it off once, and I got to, you know, I was way too close to all the. We would get some of the stretches there are a mile wide and. I would pass these huge boats and they'd say, get away, you're too close, you're too close. Well, I just wanted to see their boat. But there's so much space there. There's so much space there that they allow one another a generous berth and nobody really ever gets a lot of places. Nobody really gets too close to each other. But my work was primarily St. Louis to St. Paul and the Minneapolis St. Paul Harbor, Chicago Harbor and Illinois River. Um, for a while I worked for Twin City Barge when we worked on it, we had a, we had a really fast oil run boat on a boat called the North Star. It was 3,200 horsepower and it had a two-piece unit oil tow. And we went like a, we went fast with that. That was, at that time, there was um, apparently a, a desire for, if they needed a bulk amount of oil quickly from one spot to another, there was, it's almost kind of like a hot shot deal. And we'd load out these barges and away we'd go. And in, that's 3,200 horsepower with two, with a, you, you, we would make pretty close to 20 miles an hour southbound out of St. Louis. And that's fast. That's really going with a big tow. That's, that's really going. Yes, Jessica. So 
So about four years ago, we had a tow with about 15 barges get hung up on a wing dam. Wow, wow. Tell us what a day like that is like. Oh, I'm man. I'm a captain. <laughs> Great question. Jessica said a number of years ago, there was a tow got hung up on a wing dam down here. Right and, down here. Yeah, tell us how, it, how that goes. If you... Um, if um, that's relatively uncommon, if uh, the the if you'll notice, if you're out uh, motorboating or or out on the river, you'll you can generally see this little ripple in the water, especially from up above where the wing dams are, and there's almost always a buoy on the end of a wing dam. Well, if something happens and that buoy gets ripped out of there, and the captain or pilot doesn't know it's there or it. I used to be one of the first captains up here in the spring and almost always one of the first ones, last ones back out because we would take Twin City Barge boats over to Chicago and vice versa when spring opened up up here. And we ran a lot without buoys and we could, we could, we could find ourselves in that predicament. The answer to your question is, um, especially if you, if you hit something, more frequently than that you would have a toe that might run aground. And if, let's say, it's, it's just for whatever reason, there was, when, it, when the water's up for a period of time, when it goes down, and especially if it goes down fast, there'll be all sorts of shallow spots that, that show up. When the water was running, there's some sand drifted into it, and it becomes kind of a shoal. Well, if you hit one of those, and you stick a toe really good, you can spend hours and hours and hours actually having to take apart. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta pull the barges apart and, and maybe one of them has got some damage and it's sinking or it's, the barges have compartments, each individual barge, the 15 in a tow, they have generally five cross double compartments. So when you see the, the hopper in a, in a barge, it's a container in a container. And then on top of it, there's five sections that have bulkheads, so if you punch a hole in one section, it can fill with water, but the rest of the barge buoyancy is not impacted. It'll impact the, the barge a little bit, but generally speaking, that's kind of the safety net. So if they had a barge that, that got a hole in it or something, they might want to leave that there for a period of time and pump it out and then put somebody in there and try to patch it, and you can do all kinds of things, drive shingles and cracks and, and do all sorts of things, but the biggest most frequent thing like that that occurs is when you'll hit a shallow spot and it takes a long time sometimes and you can you can twist or turn or do whatever and it's just a it's just a bear there i'll tell you one just really quick story will show up on the second or third book there was a there is still today a uh, place just downstream on the minnesota river and minnesota river is really a tiny narrow the amount of barges that come out of there is just stunning compared you know relative to the it's really just a creek and the corps of engineers dredged a number of years ago in this place where they took a horseshoe bend and just made it go away they just went from here the horseshoe went over here and they they did a cut here they cut that out and dredged it and that place is called dredge cut and it has some rock in it. Some, some, they only could dredge to nine and a half feet. And, and in a real dead summer when there's no rain, sometimes the water gets so low up there that it's an awful time getting through there. Well, I was a young captain, and all I knew was full ahead. And we got our six barges, and we would run down through those loads. And I was just determined, I, 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 know, how to, I know how to thread this needle and get through here. Everybody was grounding there. And sure enough, we would pile, because, well, here's the deal. We would pile up, I'd have to bust up the toe, we'd goof around, go around the other end, face up, back, screw around, wiggle, squirm, just spent hours and hours and hours. By contrast, there was an old captain, Tom, you'd recognize this name, Jay Sampson was the first guy I saw do this. And he was a real old captain, but they would take that same six barges and before they got down there, they'd run around to the front end of the tow and hook onto it, face up, and they'd back it down through there. And they just crawled along. And it drove me nuts because I was just, just all I knew was we got, a, we got, those guys are being so lazy, but they never got stuck. And you know why? Because they were putting the water from the wheel wash under the tow, and I was sucking it all out when I was running. You know, I just, I didn't know any better at that time. I didn't know anything but full ahead. And it took an old sage pro like that to kind of demonstrate to me that that's, that's how that goes. But yeah, the answer to your question is that's, um, 
doesn't happen too often. More frequently than that, they'll run into an unexpected shallow place and maybe ground. If you, if you, if somebody hits a bridge or somebody hits that, that can be a, a big deal. That can be. How much money is lost in that? Eight oh, hours of huge, huge amounts of dollars. It's um, it's a, a very. Um, I think that they pay generous insurance premiums for those for those operations. They're, they're really there's a lot at stake and a lot of you can do a lot of damage really really quickly and easy. Other questions? Yes. Is large business good? Is it down way? Is technology done anything to improve it or anything? Great question. Um, is the barge business good? Has technology changed or done anything? Um, I do a little bit of reading about it. In preparing for this talk, I did some reading and I I. Um, it, there was a time when it was a pretty robust industry, and then it's sort of like a lot of things. I think some of the big, big financing companies came in, and, and it, there's only a handful of operators now, and they sort of set the tone. and And I think the the markets generally, if I I, I, I might be wrong about this, but generally speaking, the markets in the international arena are really volatile. You know, with tariffs right now and the stuff that we need for our streets and, and utility pipes has gone through the roof because of the threat of tariffs and various different things. And I don't really know, um, it's a really good question and I wish I was very, very knowledgeable about it, but I, I think it's a different business today than it was. And I think, you know, they're still obviously, it's still obviously profitable, but I bet it's a, there are not very many companies. There's um, a lot of the boats that you see go by here have the name Ingram on them and that's one of the biggest Biggest guys. Artco is another real big player. Good question. Others? Yes? Hi. You, uh, I'm sure don't remember me by looks, but mm -hmm. I was piling the mic in uh, Gary Harris back in the. Yeah, in yeah, the, sure, sure. Mike, yeah. yeah. You know, I met you very, very few times face to face, but we used to be at yeah. the reading. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a lot of stories you're telling, all right? And I yeah. That. I'm still in the water, by the way. I'm working for a large construction company now. Very good. Window, Excellent. Went on bridge. Yeah. But I just thought I'd throw it in. There's ladies with lots of questions. <laughs> you mentioned coke. Like yeah. I used to run a two-piece unit too. Uh, we ran heated oil. And my oil that we ran was called poker oil. Okay. That's farther down the line than coke. Maybe we were told that was the excrement of refining oil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'd stop at every place time we'd stop, we'd talk to somebody with a milk pool like ours. I'd ask them what it was and nobody knew it. Yeah. We delivered the barges in New Orleans and I asked the uh, guy there and he says, Oh, that's cocoa, you know, poker. And I said, Yeah, what is it? And it's poor. He says, well, we'll offload it, reload it onto ships that are going over to Italy, and it gets sold to, like, Maybelline and makeup companies like that. Really? And they turn that into a carbon black. Wow. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? There are, we had a barge one time with a federal marshal on it, and, and he told me the barge was full of wine. Not, <laughs> I, you know, I can't, that's the only time I've ever heard of that, but there's a, there's a lot of really unique bulk commodities around. Yes? Was it wine in bottles or was it wine? No, it was in the tank barge. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was in boxes. It was all circa, you know, <laughs> box wine. It was good wine. <laughs> High quality wine. Yes? If you uh, loaded a, a, a tug up here, how far down the river would that tug go with that load? So if you, if a, Tow, 15 barge tow leaves St. Paul. Generally speaking, they'll go, they'll, they, they'll go to like St. Paul to St. Louis, Chicago or the Upper Illinois River to St. Louis. St. Louis is kind of the hub. When you get to St. There's, there's starting here at lock two, then you go 27 locks. There's a, there's the tw lock 27 is right, almost downtown St. Louis. Immediately below that, there's a huge number of fleets. Because from there down, it's wide open. So then they take that 15 barges and add another 15, and they'll go with 30 southbound. And then when they get to Cairo and they get to the lower, 176 miles between um, 
St. Louis and Cairo, and then you get to the lower Mississippi where the Ohio River comes in, then it gets real wide and sometimes there's 40, 50 barges. Those boats are 10,000 horsepower typically. And, and then the barges go from here to St. Louis and are to top. Yeah, and it, but, it, but the, so when they get to St. Louis, the boat that takes the 30 barges is probably a 7,000 horsepower boat. So the other guy turns around, comes back up here with his 5,000 horsepower boat. Then we get to Cairo, that 7,000 horsepower boat probably comes back to St. Louis. And that's kind of, sometimes they turn one another and they do all kinds of strategic things. There's more and more grain um, and, and commodity locations on the Mississippi and Illinois River. There's a, a lot more um, soybean oil production. And there's a lot of corn goes to sweeteners. So there's, you know, a lot of bulk corn that leaves here in a barge goes over the Illinois River and it turns, it's turned into sugar pops. You know, frankly, that's, that's what a lot of the, the corn goes to. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Yes, go. I came up from New Orleans once and we were thinking back, but the boat we were on was Cardinal McMillan, the old one. Oh, wow. 12,500, and the guy had 78 barges put on. Ah. A mile out in front of us, he had a ball thrust. Wow. Our little boat only had 2,700 horsepower, and we just piggybacked back alongside. Yeah. Except when you come to the cuts where the current ran, he'd have us turn it on, go full ahead, and leave it. He's giving a little brush. David. Uh, Let's give him a little David bit of a push. Wow! Wow! Those are those are marvelous, yeah, remarkable you things. You had the city of Prescott out in front of you going up river. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's there's a there's a lot of acreage. Some of the I have a picture in the book of a barge, or of a tow that has, um, it has 47 barges, the tow does. And I did some math, I wish I could find it here quickly. I did some math. If, if uh, you took the number of semi-trailers of wheat in that tow and stacked them end to end, it'd go 23 and a half miles. That's how that, there's, on a big tow like that, they'd be stacked end to end. All right, so I don't want to, this is, wow, this is just wonderful. I don't want to, I don't want to overextend my welcome. So probably we should wrap up or what do you think? So do you want? Oh yeah. Why don't we, why don't we, I'm going to be here. I'd be happy to autograph a book. I have books for sale. Jessica here has books for sale if you need. I don't have a credit card arrangement, but I'd be happy to, they're $10 each. Um, um, and I'd be happy to autograph one and, and sell one if you'd, if you'd like. And, and thank you all so much. I, w I want to visit with all of you. But thank you.